This episode of the Gondrepreneur Podcast is made possible by 420 friendly service providers in the Gondrepreneur Business Directory. If you need professional help with your business, from accounting to legal services to consulting, marketing, payment processing, or insurance, visit gondrepreneur.com slash businesses to find service providers who specialize in helping cannabis entrepreneurs like you. Visit the Gondrepreneur Business Directory today at gondrepreneur.com slash businesses. Hey there, I'm your host, TG Brandfault, and thank you for listening to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast, where we try to bring you actionable information and normalize cannabis through the stories of gondrepreneurs, activists, and industry stakeholders. Today, I'm joined by Morris Beagle. He's a hemp industry entrepreneur, co-founder, and president of WAFBA. We are for better alternatives, family of companies, which includes the annual Hemp Expo, No Co Hemp Expo. Since 2012, Beagle has developed global brands in the hemp space with eight companies from No Co to Colorado Hemp Company to Let's Talk Hemp to Silver Mountain Hemp Guitars. Uh, how are you doing this afternoon, Morris? Doing good, TG. Thanks for having me on. I'm delighted to have you on. Uh, I really like having the, the hemp guys on. You guys are always an interesting breed. Um, so before we sort of get into everything that, that we want to cover today, uh, tell me about yourself, man. How did you end up in the space? Well, I was in the music industry for... 25 years or so, basically from the late 80s, 1987, 88, up and through 2010, 2011, I had a music production company, One Stop Shop, called Happy Scratch Records that I had started in 95 when I moved back to Colorado. And when I moved back to Colorado in 95 and started this, I was inspired by the Seattle scene and how Seattle blew up and I got to spend a bunch of time there. And, you know, you had Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Soundgarden and Alice in Chains. And coming back to Colorado, I wanted to kind of see the same thing happen here. There's a great local music scene, pretty diverse and, and not as focused as the Seattle scene was. But when I moved back here, I got dialed into Fort Collins. Uh, I grew up in Loveland, but Fort Collins had a store there called The Hemper Wears No Clothes. And it was based off the Jack Hare book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes. And I read that book and Jack's kind of, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the prophet of the industry, the entire cannabis industry, but brought light to a lot of what hemp can do and and the difference uh the difference between hemp and marijuana but yet it's all cannabis so that's really when i got introduced to it and i didn't really become a hempster at that point i've always been a overall cannabis supporter and uh, partaker for quite some time and as i did my music business stuff i did run some hemp merchandise i did some hemp shirts and hemp hats but really never got into the hemp thing in the cannabis space until the music business thing kind of crashed for me. I was really dialed into the physical media side of things with CDs and DVDs and manufacturing and packaging and physical product distribution into retail stores and through wholesale accounts. And, and here comes the internet and the digital age and Napster and mp3.com and followed by iTunes and Amazon and all these other digital platforms that really pretty much eliminated the record store market, except for a handful of cool stores that still do vinyl and merchandise. And But the CD market got decimated and, and my business kind of dried, dried up and I was looking for something else to channel my skill set into. And the cannabis thing was happening in Colorado with medical being pretty strong as of 2009, a lot of dispensaries started opening up. And then in 2012, we ran Amendment 64, which legalized recreational marijuana and taxed and regulated it just like alcohol. And within that legislation, there was an opportunity for farmers here in Colorado to start growing industrial hemp. And at that point in time, I thought, you know, it would be a great transition to move from the music space and into the hemp and cannabis space and start a merchandise company. And, and that's what kind of happened in 2012. We started Colorado Hemp Company as a merchandise company doing t-shirts and hats and working with some other textile brands that did apparel and wallets and bags and shoes. And, and that's really how we got started. And the following year, we started a paper printing business to, using hemp paper. I had found a hemp paper company that I started buying paper from. And the following year, we started doing events, which were a needed thing to educate 
people about industrial hemp, not only the industry itself, as we were getting to be brand new, but consumers as well. And so that's basically laid the platform for what is WAFBA and where we've gone with this. And that was with merchandise and, and printing and, and paper, and then the event side of things with bringing people together and the education and the advocacy and, and really just trying to figure out how to facilitate an industry and help uh, move the thing forward by bringing people together. So tell, can, can you tell me about any parallels between sort of the early music industry and, and the early, you know, when you decided to get into the hemp industry, it was pretty early. Yeah. So I think that there's really a lot of parallels when you, when you look at, there's a supply chain and in the music industry, that would be musicians going into the studio and, and making music. And from there that it, it would have producers and editors and then marketers and, and selling product to, to the public. And the hemp industry is similar where you've got farmers and you've got processors and you've got manufacturers and you've got marketers and you've got events. And, and what you have in both spaces is a lot of creative people. So I've seen a real parallel in just the creative element and people thinking outside of the box in this space. It's, it's just a different mindset and people with a slightly different intention and maybe kind of a counterculture approach. You, you mentioned the counterculture and, and you know, I want to sort of go back to earlier when you were talking about, you know, the early grunge scene. I'm a, I'm a huge grunge guy. I love Mud Honey and Jesus Lizard. Um, mud Honey. Love Mud Honey. Um, I've, I saw Mud Honey at the off ramp in Seattle back in, I think, 91, 92. Oh, it was great. Be still my heart. Um, is that something that you think drew you to the hemp industry? Was this sort of counterculture? I mean, it seems like you, you were pretty entrenched in it before you entered the space. Well, when I was really trying to figure out what I what was going to be the next step of my life after spending so much time in the music industry, and I wanted to do something that A, is fun, B, that I'm passionate about and I really care about that could make a difference, and that I just feel good about what I'm doing and putting out into the world and that my kids would be proud of me about. So it, it was just one of these things. I just, I felt compelled to do it because I, I think that our world needs to wake up socially and consciously and, and just become more aware of, of what we're doing in our everyday lives and, and to our planet and to our environment. And I really just think that hemp can be a game changer in changing the way people think about our, our world, our planet and our environment and how we should grow crops and how we should produce finished goods and how we should recycle and replenish all of that. And I, I just think that, that that's what drew me to it. It's kind of what drew me to music. There was just this art and this, this presence that drew me into music. That's, that's really, yeah, I don't know what the exact word is. I've tried to figure it out before, but it, it's that something else that's out there that just draws you the invisible spirit, the invisible energy. When did you decide, you know, that you were going to go all in with hemp? I mean, it's a risk, you know, you, you deal with the banking issues and, and, you know, sort of being ancillarily associated with, you know, cannabis. And then you said you had, you had kids. So, you know, I mean, and you do so many different things. When, when was it that you were like, all right, this is what I'm doing? It was really in 2012 and 2013 when we started the company I felt really passionate about that cannabis was on the way to becoming legalized and becoming socially acceptable. And it was funny that marijuana was leading the way when hemp has, should have never been illegal in the first place. You don't utilize hemp to, to get high or to get intoxicated. And, and I felt good about being on this side of the plant and really not being a, 
a big activist for the medical and the recreational sides. And not that I, I'm not an advocate and I don't support it because I do. I don't think anybody should go to jail for the plant period. I think anybody should be able to utilize this plant for medicinal purposes and, and get themselves off of some of these prescription drugs that cannabis absolutely can replace. And it's being shown over and over and over, not only in peer review science um, studies, but the anecdotal evidence is just, it's, you know, mounds and mounds and mounds of it. So, and anecdotal evidence does matter. And when you look at the industrial side of it, the food side of it, nutrition, health and wellness and therapeutic side with all the hemp and the cannabinoids and CBD, the protein, the amino acids, all of it, it's all good. There's nothing, there's no cons about this plant in my eyes. So I just felt really good about jumping into this space. And I'm, I'm all in till the end. So th the only negative thing about uh, smoking a joint is that you can go to jail for it. And that's some adage. Well, yeah, that, that, that is a negative thing and, and nobody should go to jail for this. And I absolutely will stand up and, and fight till this thing is fully legal. And, and people that have gone to jail for, for it should all be expunged. All that should be off their record. So I want to switch gears a little bit. I want to talk to you about the NoCo Hemp Expo. I, it's it's often referred to as, as the most important hemp uh, industry event. Uh, it's won, uh, you know, that distinction twice by the Hemp Industries Association. Can you tell me about how it started and how it evolved into this award-winning industry venture? Well, we started it in 2014 because there was a need to have hemp centric events which weren't really going on there were a handful of small little gatherings at libraries and in universities and like a conference room and with very little as far as product display or networking or true education and that's what really was the catalyst is hey we got to have conferences and trade shows and so we put on this first trade show and a buddy of mine that I'd worked with in the music industry and a good friend of mine was booking this place called Ricky B's in Windsor, which is a club that's got a multitude of rooms. It's got a big open room with a stage and a bar and a kitchen and another room where you could put some exhibitors. And so it had this setup where we could throw an event and have speakers, we could have live music, we could have food, we could make a hemp beer, which we did and we could have a full-on event. And we launched NOCO in April of 2014 and pretty much sold it out. There was like 330 people at the event and the, the place was full all day and we had a really good response and a lot of great people threw in to participate right at the get-go of, of this industry. And, and so we moved it to a bigger venue the next year out at the Ranch Events Complex in Loveland and had about 1,250 people. And then we increased our space again and had like 3,000 people. And then it went to 6,000. And this year we had over 10,000 people. And it's just continued to, to grow and grow and grow as far as the amount of companies and, and industry people participating in the amount of general public that has become really interested in, in the plant and the different products that are made from it. So it's just one of these things that's been, that's just continued to grow over and over and over. And it's kind of like a band, you know, how you, you start your garage band and you play a small dingy club and you got 10 people there and then you go to the next place and you got 50 people. And then, you know, the next thing you know, you're playing stadiums like U2 and Metallica. That wasn't my experience in a band. Uh <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't mine either, but you know, that, that, that's the road. You know, you two started off in shitty little clubs, just like Metallica did. So how important is sort of in-person networking in the internet age? You know, I mean, everyone has an Instagram, everyone has a Facebook, um, you know, why are events like these so important? I don't think that there's any way to replace face-to-face -face networking time and <laughs> gatherings with entertainment and just the ability to network and socialize and get to know people as well as go to conferences and and hear experts speak on a variety of topics and be able to interact with those people ask questions and learn i just to me there's just there's no 
uh, equating to having the live situation and being part of that or just participating online and social media and little conference rooms and virtual this and virtual that. There's a lot of business that can be done that way. I mean, I do business that way too, but I would say the appearing at events and trade shows just goes a long way to building real relationships. And uh, the the NOCO uh, event happened, uh, the expo happened pretty recently. Uh, can you tell me about sort of uh, what people were were talking about at that event? You know, what was the buzz buzz uh, during during the show? Well, the a big buzz is is the farm bill passed and at the end of two thousand eighteen, Trump signed it on December twentieth. So the farm bill passing is. Now we're federally legal. It's no longer associated with the Controlled Substances Act. The DEA has no jurisdiction over hemp. It now falls under the USDA, and it also has the FDA in the mix. So the the big buzz is, is A, now it's federally legal. B, how are we going to regulate it? And C, how is the FDA going to come in here with their recommendations for regulation of this plant? So that's really the hot topic. And that's going on right now. What are these federal regulations coming down from the USDA and the FDA going to look like in the end? And and how restrictive is that going to be for parts of our industry to, to really be able to grow? <clears throat> and is it going to is it going to block out some of the the smaller, more boutique, entrepreneur, craft type producers? So there's there's a lot of questions that remain. So um, I won't, we'll get we'll get into more of the federal the new federal regulations a little bit later. And and we've sort of been dancing around uh, the the music issue throughout the this episode. Uh, tell me about the guitar company, man, Silver Mountain Guitars. Uh, how do you use hemp in the production? Um, you know, give give me the rundown. And what I'd want to know is is how it sounds compared to a traditional guitar. Okay, so have you listened to my podcast? I, I have. Okay, so that intro guitar piece is the hemp guitar. Okay. That I play. So the, the the sound is the, the sound is great. You can load whatever pickups in there, whatever hard hardware you want. But it's the the body of the guitar is a bass fiber composite shell that's molded around a wood core. So it's not a solid body hemp guitar, but the, there's a, a bass fiber composite molded shell that wraps around a wood core, and they're fairly light they're lighter than a wood guitar and again they, they sound really good i've got i've done sg i've done two tellies got a les paul jr i've got another sg on the way and i'm going to be creating a strat model for a buddy of mine he's the he's going to be the first guy that we actually do a custom one for but i've been really just kind of dialing in with these guys who've been making these for the last five or six years in Canada, and it, they've been, it's still in somewhat prototype mode as far as it's, they've been a hard, it's been hard being able to, to scale up and be able to produce these on a larger, uh, on a larger scale. So I think that we have finally getting ready to clear that hurdle. It seems that way. Um, we're also making ukuleles with these guys. And I think that that production, there's just been a few technical tweaks with some of the finishing and and some of this material that's got certain nuances uh, in the production side of things. But I think that we're about to the point where it's a done deal. And we just, now it's about scaling up and being able to produce these in some type of quantity rather than one a month. So I, I, mean, I hear a lot that that people who are, you know, trying to do these sort of unique projects with hemp have a very hard time finding processors. Is that something that, that you're experiencing? And, and are people at, at the trade shows uh, recognizing that that exists? And, and could we see that sort of market uh, filled pretty soon? Yes. There is definitely a lack of processing here in the United States outside of extraction for cannabinoids, oil, extracts, all of that. That's really the processing that's that's 
pretty available in the U.S., but there's there's still not enough processing for as much material that's going to be grown this year. I can tell you that there's going to be big issues with that. And we definitely have a lack of fiber processing, which is what I'm really excited about. I really got into the industry based on the fiber side of things for composites and plastics and building materials and textiles. That's what drew me into it. And I like the food part of it, too, with the hemp seeds and the pressed oil and the protein powder. Um, but the, there's a long ways to go with the processing for that here in the United States and in North America overall for the fiber side, not the food side. Canada has been doing the, the food, grain, hemp hearts thing for 20 years. But there's definitely a lack of the processing, but that is going to change now since the farm bill was signed. There's more confidence in the investors market. People realize that there is value in the fiber, the stock side of it. Implementing that processing is going to take the next two or three years to really start building stuff out and being able to utilize that material to get it into a paper or building materials and bioplastics and in some of these industrial processes where it will make it easier for guys like me that want to make more guitars or guitar cabinets or plastic guitar picks that are biodegradable with hemp plastic. So the, right now, it's there's a handful of us out there that are doing these kind of novelty things, at least here in the United States. And there's people that are doing a lot more than that over in Europe because Europe's been doing this fiber side of thing and they're the most advanced when it comes to utilizing fiber for a variety of different industries. Uh, China does a variety of that too. They're more geared on the textiles, apparel side of thing. But we need to get a lot of this European technology over here, as well as some of the Chinese technology and, and build out this fiber side of things, because that's where we're going to be able to have a tremendous impact in this country. So it sounds like you focus a lot on industrial issues or industrial uses rather. And, and you know, whenever we talk about hemp, we always end up on CBD. How, which, you know, that I've been covering this since 2014 and, and even, you know, just five years ago, CBD wasn't sort of the hot hemp uh, issue. How has the industry changed with the rise of, in CBD interest? Well, when I started in 2012, nobody was even talking about CBD that was in my circle. <laughs> There's people talking about CBD and other cannabinoids in the marijuana, marijuana side of things. And things just started to shift. There's a couple of companies, I guess, Hemp Meds, Cannavest, which has turned into CV Sciences. There was that group of guys based out of San Diego that really started making this CBD from hemp thing. Um, a real business. And th these guys forged a brand new industry. And a lot of people really don't know that story. And it would be a good story for you to investigate is kind of this San Diego underground group that that really developed the beginnings of the CBD market. Um, but as you look where it is today, it's the vast, vast majority of what the market is. It's driving all the economics of it. And I mean, I think it's great. And I think that that once it gets settled, it should be regulated just like a dietary supplement, just like a food ingredient. That's exactly what it is. And hopefully we get the FDA there and we don't have to overregulate the producers to get this product on the market. But that stuff should be in apothecary sections across the country. And people, consumers should have the choice as to where they're going to get their cannabinoids. If they want to take them and they don't want to get high, they should be able to go to Whole Foods or Vitamin Cottage. If they want to go get them at their dispensary and have THC, that they should be able to do that. And if they want to go to their doctor and to their pharmacist, because that's who they trust and they want, you know, medications from whatever pharmaceutical company with CBD or other cannabinoids, in it, then the consumer should have that option too. So... Uh, it's interesting to see how these channels are developing and hopefully here in the next couple of years, they'll be pretty defined and we'll have a, a clear path for hemp derived CBD and cannabinoid products and you'll have your adult use side of the market and you'll have your pharmaceutical side. So what are a couple industrial applications that many people might not think about? Um, you know, you're, you're obviously really tuned in to this industrial side. 
Well, let's let's start with the, just what can be done on the on the fiber side. So you can make textiles, you can make clothing and carpet and upholstery. You can make composites. There's a lot of car manufacturers in Europe. This is a market that they've created is making the inside door paneling and trim pieces uh, using a hemp flax based plastic composite. Um, that's lighter and way more eco-friendly and environmentally less, uh, you know, less impactful on the earth. Um, building materials they've been utilizing in in Europe for a long time in other parts of the world. Uh, you can make way greener, more sustainable homes using hemp-based building materials. Uh, new development in the last three or four years is the ability to take this hemp fiber and put it in, and create carbon nano sheets that could be utilized in supercapacitors and battery storage. So I think that's, yeah, that's a pretty exciting technology that's out there that people are going to be developing. And I think you're going to see stuff for the, for the oil and gas industry, uh, loss prevention materials. There's, different materials that have been created or attempted to be created in the last decade that could go into whether that's into fracking situations or oil cleanup and being able to absorb all this stuff. And Texas now coming on board, there's a whole bunch of people from the oil and gas industry that are looking to start growing hemp and utilizing industrial materials for the oil and gas industry to help clean up some of this shit that they've been doing for the last 50 to 100 years. So that's interesting. It's it, how can hemp clean up the stuff that's been poisoning our earth? So you've mentioned the farm bill a couple of times. And, and I mean, we're, we're, we're sort of standing on a precipice right now. We're, we're, we're awaiting the FDA regulations. Uh, they've, you know, as, as I'm sure you're, you're aware, they've uh, sort of pointed to Epidelioc uh, saying that there's a patent on CBD, um, which sort of muddies the CBD waters despite uh, the passage of the farm bill. We have no clear direction from the FDA. Um, but it was only a few months ago, right, seemingly, that, you know, I guess almost a year ago that the farm bill was passed. Um, how has the industry changed uh, since the passage of that farm bill, like for companies on the ground? I would say that a lot of companies, smart companies, are getting all of their operations in place. Uh, they're using uh, GMP uh you know, compliant facilities making products in a way that are going to stand up and to the scrutiny of of the dietary supplement industry that's the direction that these companies are going people are not backing off people are moving forward like nothing's going to happen a lot of people are they're just rolling the dice and throwing a lot of money at it there is going to be stuff coming down the pipe that's going and people are going to have crop failures and there there is going to be some serious chaos that happens in this industry in the next couple of years but i do think when the regulatory process is done that these products will be regulated like dietary supplements and like another food ingredient is the sort of lack of FDA clarifications, is that the biggest issue facing the industry right now? Or is it something, you know, that, that we don't think about people who aren't in the industry don't think about? That's a really good question. I would say that the FDA thing is really the biggest unknown at this point. But I, I would say that a lot of people that there's so much money involved in this now. And there, there's a lot of political clout that's pushing for what seems to be um, a properly regulated industry so we can create these products and a lot of people can compete in the marketplace. Um, but the crystal ball is a little bit fuzzy. I'm, it's, you know, I'm in it every day and, you know, I'm not exactly sure I am hopeful that, that things in the end, that we're gonna have an industry that's just like any other, um, 
agricultural type of industry. That's what this is. It's an agricultural crop. We know now with the passage of the farm bill that the stocks and the seeds are grass generally recognized as safe. So we can do whatever we want with those parts of the plant. The only thing that is cloudy is this flower side, the extraction side and how these cannabinoids are going to be dealt with when it comes to growing, processing, and the final product. Are any T is any THC going to be allowed in these final products? Um, is isolate going to be able to be used from any of these compounds or are all the isolates basically going to belong to the pharmaceutical industry and all we can use are these full spectrum, broad spectrum, whole plant extracts there's clarification that, that's going to be coming down the pipe. I'm not exactly sure where it'll end up. A lot of people don't think we're going to be able to use isolates, that those will be deemed the, to the pharmaceutical industry. So, you know, you, you said the, the crystal ball's a little fuzzy. Uh, well, look into your crystal ball for me. And what do you think, let, taking CBD out of it, right? Let's say the FDA says, you know, you cannot, you know, isolate CBD, whatever. Uh, what do you think? would be the next big hemp sort of thing the next big hemp thing i think yeah, that's, that's industrial i would say animal animal feed and animal products pet products that's you know that stuff is happening to some degree now although it's not quite it's not considered legal the, you know, the the animal side of things domestically there's still uh the fda has to allow that and they're trying to fast track certain things um but there's studies that have to be done and i think that the animal feed market's going to be large for sure livestock is a huge industry which is it's another thing that we could discuss for a long time is industrial agriculture and the industrial livestock industry, which is terrible for our environment and the climate. But um, I'm sorry, I think fiber, I think the grain, that's where it has to go. Protein powder, there people are becoming more organic, more regenerative, more plant-based foods cannabinoids are going to be there They're, it's it's a health and wellness product it's a plant that can do all these things so what's the next big thing i think that the all the uses that it all the potential replacements that it can go into these various industries and replacing these these different ingredients to green up products across the industrial spectrum i mean that, that that's going to be huge. It's I don't know if it's necessarily one thing. I think it's just a combination of all the things that we've been talking about for a long time that hemp can do 25,000 different things or 50,000 different things. What is that number? We're going to find out that number over the course of the next 10 or 20 years because there's a significant um, interest to, to get this crop grown in large acreage and to get into the market. So finally, what advice would you have for entrepreneurs looking to enter, you know, the, the industrial hemp space, not the CBD space, not the cannabis space, but, but the, the space that, that you are sort of, you know, entrenched in, what's your advice for them? Well, first advice is get into something that you really like and that you're really passionate about. Don't make it just because you think there's going to be money in it. Um, I think people are misdirected when it comes to that too often. And I've been fortunate as an entrepreneur to follow my heart and follow my passions through the music industry and now into the hemp and cannabis space, because this is what I want to do. I'm, I'm, I love what I do. And me being a fiber guy, I'm going to do my part. And I suggest this to anybody at this point in time, if you're interested in the fiber side, now is the time because we have the opportunity as entrepreneurs, as innovators to really create something that's never been created here in the United States. And that is a hemp fiber side of the market. And there's technology out there domestically and internationally that has yet to be implemented that a, we need to come across and discover and connect and collaborate with people that are doing this and figure out how to have it funded and get this implemented. There's an opportunity for entrepreneurs right now to, to really just create a future 
based on our own intention and our own purpose and our own vision. You're quite, quite the visionary when it, when it comes to this, man. And I, and I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, come on the show. And, you know, it's not often that we get, you know, a pure uh, industrial hemp perspective on things. And I, and I think it's, I, I, I have for a long time been a huge proponent of hemp. Um, you know, I, I would prefer a very lush hemp industry as opposed to a very lush, you know, THC rich industry. So, um, you know, where can people find out more about you, the, the WAFPA companies, uh, you know, how, how, how can they find you on the old internet? Well, you can go to WAFPA.org and that's W A F B A.org. And that's the launch page and all of our little entities are listed there. And we actually have like 12 and that's a half a dozen of those are events. And then the other half dozen, we've got tree free hemp, the paper side, let's talk hemp, the education media side, one planet hemp, our t-shirt and hat and merchandise store. And, and I don't know. I can't even remember all the little brands. <laughs> we've, we've got quite a few and, and that's where you can find it. You can also go to morrisbeagle.com and I've got a lot of links there as well. And you can go to nocohempexpo.com. And, and that's what people, if you want to find out really what's happening in the hemp industry, if you do get a chance, you should come to Noco Hemp Expo, especially Noco 7 that'll be in 2020. We're moving to a brand new space that's three times where we were at last year, where we packed it out with 10,000 people. And next year, we hope to have 20,000 plus, and we'll have 400 plus exhibitors and great programming for the business side, the investor side, the farm side, the equipment side. And we're just really excited to do what we can to help facilitate this industry and bring people together and, and make it real and make a difference. It's Morris Beagle. He's a hemp industry entrepreneur, co-founder, and president of the WAFBA. We are for better alternatives, family of companies, which includes that aforementioned NOCO Hemp Expo. Thank you so much for being on the show, Morris. It's really been a pleasure. Hey, thanks, TG. I appreciate you having me on. You can find more episodes of the Gontrepreneur.com podcast in the podcast section of Gontrepreneur.com and in the Apple iTunes store. On the Gontrepreneur.com website, you'll find the latest cannabis news and cannabis jobs updated daily, along with transcripts of this podcast. You can also download the Gontrepreneur.com app in iTunes and Google Play. This episode was engineered by Trim Media House. I've been your host, TG Brandfault. Fultz.